this will be updates in public international law. So I hope yung ating mga internet connection ay stable at hindi katulad ng mga jowa ninyo na madalas naglolo ko. <laughs> okay, madalas unstable. So you'll be joining us in the bar and all lawyers are very prayerful. Ito yung lagi ko sinasabi sa mga abogado at mga law students, the prayer of St. Thomas More. Okay? Na ang Lord grant that I may be able in argument, accurate analysis, strict and study, candidate clients, and honest with adversaries. Lawyers or not, we need to be honest. Although sa panahon daw ngayon, alam ko alam na ito na iba sa inyo, yung honesty raw is such a lonely word. No? Wala nang tapat. Parang tanghali na lang ang tapat. Anyway, <laughs> so... Remember this, that for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Eh? So, tandaan palagi natin ito. Okay, so, ang sabi nitong si Joseph Story, a former justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, sabi niya, the law is a jealous mistress and requires a long and constant courtship. So, but that is not reason for you to have mistresses later on. Ha? Kasi yan ang nagdadala ng stress daw sa buhay. Mistress. My stress. Ha? Okay. So, if you want to know more of other lectures that I have, punta kayo dito sa YouTube channel na ito. You may also subscribe if you want. Libre naman yan. And you may also want to join this uh, Facebook group in which I upload every now and then materials that could help you not only in the bar but also in your practice as well. Uh, ayan. So, libre yan. Kasi maraming mga sites sa internet na pag nag-download kayo, eh hinihingi ang kayo ng credit card. But here, you'll get the materials for free. Okay? Now, if you want to have a printed copy, eto naman. Puna kayo sa Rex Bookstore. <laughs> Meron dyan, Public International. And all my lectures this morning will be taken from this book. No? That is published in 2021. Oh, nauna dyan, 2017. It is the revised edition. So, what do you mean by international law? It's a branch of public law that regulates the relations between states and other entities that have been granted international personality. That was first used by this man on your screen, Jeremy Bentham. Teka, bakit may mga drawing? <laughs> What's happening? Okay, so it was interchangeably used with the term loss of nation. So the word international law, according to Jeremy Bentham, it must be acknowledged, is a new one. Though it is hope sufficiently analogous and intelligible, it is calculated to express the branch of law, which goes commonly under the name of the law of nations. So, siya ang una nag-introduce nito. Okay? Now, why is there a need for international law? Because we have the so-called law of nature school. Okay, ano ba itong law of nature school na ito? Uh, it is based on the universal principle of right and wrong. Okay, that whether you are a state or an individual, you have to do what is right and avoid what is evil. And that was taken from the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, yung kanyang na philosophy of natural law. No? Sabi niya, the first rule of morality, whether you are a state or an individual, is to do what is good and avoid what is evil. So, yan ho ang kuha natin dyan. Ano? Pinanggalingan yan. So, whether a state or an individual do what is good, avoid what is evil. Buti na lang, hindi ito ginagawa ng mga tao. No? Kasi pag ginawa lahat yan ng tao, <laughs> wala na tayong kliyente. Everybody do, is doing what is good and avoiding what is evil. And the other basis is the positive school. No? Positive school. That the binding force of international law is derived from the agreement of the parties. Okay? That uh, the states are bound by their treaties. So when they enter into an agreement or treaty governed by the Vienna Convention on the Laws of Treaties, they're not subordinating themselves. They're just coordinating. So for example, when we join uh, the United Nations way back in 1945, incidentally today, is the effectivity of the San Francisco Declaration in 1945, also known as the United Nations Day, October 24. Okay? So, tama-tama yung lecture natin sa international law. We'll be talking about United Nations later on. Eh? So, 
still, even if they are not subordinating, they are governed by the Latin principle in international of pacta son servanda. That promises must be fulfilled. That is the literal meaning in English. So parties to a treaty must adhere thereto in good faith. Diba? So if they are entering into a treaty, they have to surrender some of their supposed sovereignty. That's why in the case of Tanyada versus Angara, the Supreme Court said that sovereignty is never absolute. Because there are inherent limitations. In fact, in our constitution, when you, um, as a member of international community, we are incorporating into our laws and inter the internationally accepted principles of law. Okay? And you have the third one. We'll discuss that later on. You have the third one, the eclectic or the Grotian school, derived from a Dutch statesman known as Hugo Grotius. He is arguably the father of international law. But please, do not ask me who the mother is. I, I really do not know. Kilala ko lang yung father. <laughs> Maka illegitimate child itong international law. Eh? Okay. So it's a compromise between the positivist and the naturalist school. So even if you enter into a treaty, you still have to observe the principles of right. Okay. So what about the, what about the functions of international law? Number one, promote international peace and security. Ang sabi ko sa mga estudyante ko dito, uh, pag sinabi international, para lang kayo nanu uh, nanunood ng beauty contest. World peace. <laughs> That's the ultimate goal. Okay, so why do we apply international law in the local jurisdiction? Because of the doctrine of incorporation. Where do we find that? In our constitution itself. That international laws are adopted as part of the state's municipal law or the law of the land. Article 2, Section 2 of the Philippine Constitution of 1987 states that the Philippines renounces war as an instrument of national policy. Adapts the generally accepted principles of international as part of the law of the land. So, yun yung incorporation. And we adhere to the policy of peace. Ay, sino ba naman ang ayaw ng kapayapaan, di ba? Hmm. Equality, justice, freedom, cooperation, and amity with all nations. You know, the president said, we are friends to everyone and enemy, friend to everyone and enemy to no one. Because we want to have amicable relationships with all nations. That's why, sabi ng Korte Suprema, under the doctrine of incorporation, rules of international law shall form part of the law of the land. And we do not need any further action to make it implementable in the local sphere. However, even if there is doctrine of incorporation, when an international law runs into conflict with our constitution, the constitution must necessarily prevail. Because that is the fundamental law of the land. Okay? So that's why we tend to harmonize. Now, if they cannot be harmonized, regardless of the efforts that we exerted, then we let the constitution prevail. You have the doctrine of constitutional supremacy. Okay? Now, under section 2 of article 2, we renounce war. That is an incorporation of a very ancient international law doctrine known as the kellogg Bryan Pact of 1928. Between Frank Kellogg ng United States, siya yung uh, U.S. Secretary of State, at saka si our steed, Brian, I just do not know, kamag-anak niya si Kobe, huh? <laughs> uh, they entered into a treaty, U.S. and France, in 1928, saying that disputes or conflicts of whatever nature or whatever origin they may be, which may arise among them, they cannot use war. And in 1945, when the United Nations was uh, formed, its charter provided under Article 2, Section 4 that all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against international uh, territorial integrity or political independence of any state or any other manner, sorry, baliktad yung uh, spelling, inconsistent with the purpose of the UN. Because you have to uh, understand that after every world war, an international organization is formed 
to prevent another war from happening. So after World War I, states, particularly the winners, established the League of Nations to prevent another World War from happening. But the League of Nations was unsuccessful. World War II occurred because of the Nazi Germany. So after World War II, another organization, International of Nature, uh, Nature has been formed. And we now have the United Nations. And so far, if we are to evaluate the UN's performance, somehow it has prevented another world war from occurring. However, talaga yatang uh, hindi pa dumarating yung sinasabi dun sa Isaiah that they will beat their uh, swords into plowshares. Kasi may mga nanggigera pa rin. So the question is, is the invasion of Ukraine justified? Kung titignan ninyo, this is inconsistent with the Charter of the UN, particularly Article 2, Paragraph 4 that, that we have just read. So Putin, sabi ng mga Tagalog, anak ng Putin. <laughs> Dali, joke lang. Okay. So Putin's uh, aim was to over, overrun Ukraine, depose the government, ending for good its desire to join the Western Defensive Alliance. Kasi you have to understand na ang Ukraine gusto sumama sa NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Na during the Cold War between USSR and the USA, ito yung pantapat ng Western world to the threat of communism. Pantapat doon sa Warsaw Pact that was led by USSR at the time. Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Okay? So USSR. Senior. Yan yata sa Cebu, nandiyan yung junior eh. U.S. Junior. Okay? <laughs> USJR pala. Ayan. Okay. So, <laughs> sister school yan ng aming high school, Hans and Sebastian. Recoletos din. So, Putin told the Russian people that his goal was to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. That was the goal, ano? Habi ni Putin. To protect people subjected to what he called Eight years of bullying and genocide by Ukrainian government. Putin has claimed Russians and Ukrainians are one people. So Putin, I have to understand na ang kanyang history, dati po itong official ng KGB, the U uh, Soviet secret police. So bago siya naging member ng Russian parliament, uh, nung buhay pa ang USSR, pa siya ng KGB, yung katumbas ng CIA. So he was dreaming to resuscitate the ancient USSR that collapsed in 1991. So, ang justification niya, Nazi daw kasi itong si, ano eh, si Zelensky. Okay? Pero kung titingnan niyo ang history ni Zelensky, Jewish ang kanyang origin eh, yung kanyang mga ninuno. So, paano siya magiging Nazi? Eh, naging biktima nga yung kanyang ascendants o yung kanyang mga ancestors ng Nazi Germany. So, ito ho. Ang mapa kasi ng Ukraine, napakalapit sa Russia, border lang ng ang pagitan ay uh, landmass, ano tong land border. At ito yung mga controlled areas ngayon ng Russia, pero as of yesterday, parang na-pushback na ang Russian troops. Okay, konti na lang ang na-occupy nila. Now, the Russian historical view is that every hundred years or so, there's an invasion from the West. So natatakot itong si Putin na baka kapag ka ang Ukraine ay naging part ng NATO ay susunod nang i-invade ng West ang Russia. Which I think is impossible to happen. Di ba? Mm. Now, kaya ang tawag nitong si President Biden ay war criminal itong si Putin. But what is the problem with the UN? The problem is Russia, just like United States, China, France, and Great Britain, are all permanent members of the Security Council. So, kakaiba kasi ang operation ng Security Council ng UN kasi yung mga permanent members, kapag ka may decision ng Security Council, each one of the five permanent members ay may veto power. So, kinundem ng Security Council ang invasion of Ukraine. Being a threat to world peace, being a, an aggression 
against uh, and against the principles of the United Nations uh, Charter. Kaya lang yung deklarasyon na ito binito ng Russia. Imagine that. Hindi naman nag-iisa po ang Russia dyan. You have to remember, in 2003, George Bush also invaded Iraq. Kaya, sabi ni Putin, wala kang moral ascendancy, Amerika. Kasi ginawa mo rin yan noon sa Iraq. Eh. Pero sabi naman ng Amerika, there was justification. Because Saddam Hussein also invaded Kuwait. So it triggered American invasion plus the terrorist activity that uh, brought down the Twin Towers of the United States in 9-1-1, okay? September uh, 11, 2001. Retaliation daw ito. But again, retaliation is not allowed. <laughs> Di ba? Kasi nga, you cannot use war in order to get your demands. So saan natin dadalhin ang mga war criminals? We will file cases, those who are affected, before the International Criminal Court. As of today, there are three international tribunals. Under the United Nations Charter, you have the International Court of Justice. We have time, we'll discuss that. Under the United Nations Convention on the Laws of the Sea, you have the ITLO, ah, sorry, ITLOS, International Tribunal on the Laws of the Sea. Okay? And under the Rome Statute, you have the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court is very popular because for the first time in a long time since the, history, the establishment of the International Criminal Court, a Filipino president has been charged. And we'll discuss that, the charges against President Duterte. Okay? So, the ICC, ang charter ay yung tinatawag na Rome Statute. It was signed on July 17, 1998. The ICC was established as an answer to the growing criminal activities of those who are in power. Remember Rwanda. Nasa Netflix dati yan, yung Hotel Rwanda. There was genocide committed by both sides. There were two ethnic groups fighting for dominance in Rwanda. The Hutus and the Tutsis. When Tutsis were in power, they massacred the Hutus. And when Hutus got the power, they also massacred <laughs> the Tutsis. So the United Nations intervened and created the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And then late in the 90s, there was also genocide committed by Serbia against Bosnia-Herzegovina. When Yugoslavia collapsed, Serbia took dominant uh, position and invaded another republic belonging to Yugoslavia in the past. So the United Nations in 1990s, uh, 1991, 92, established the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. That's why in 1998, in order to do away with the ad hoc criminal tribunals to prosecute war criminals, um, members of the UN met in Rome and drafted the Rome Statute, thereby creating the International Criminal Court. And today, it is in full operation because under Article 126 of the Statute, eh, pag umabot sa 60 yung pumirma, at least, eh, mag-ooperate na siya. So, the ICC started operating on July 1, 2002. At present, by the way, it can only prosecute crimes committed after July 1, 2002. Hindi po pwedeng mag-retroact yung kanyang jurisdiction. At present, as of January 1, 2022, there are 123 members. Hindi nakasama ang Pilipinas dyan, ano? dahil nag-withdraw na tayo. We'll talk about that later. Ayan. So, unfortunately, the four big countries in terms of military, in terms of economy, are not members of the ICC. Okay? China, Russia. Kaya ang tanong dito, pwede bang i-prosecute si Putin eh hindi member ng ICC ang Russia? We'll answer that later on. Eh? So tandaan niyo yung tanong na yan. Can Putin be prosecuted despite the fact that Russia is not a member of the ICC? Okay? So, the newest member is Kiribati. 
Kiribati ang basa pero Kiribati ang sulat. That's one of the countries in South Pacific, malapit yan sa New Zealand at Australia. Island countries, archipelago. It joined on February 1, 2020. Okay. So only in cases where the accused is a national of a state party. So Russia is not a state party. Following that principle, Putin cannot be prosecuted. Okay? The alleged crime took place in the territory of a state party. Russia is not a state party. Or the situation is referred to the court by the UN Security Council. So yun, para ma-prosecute si Putin, the UN Security Council should refer that case for investigation by the ICC. Otherwise, without such referral, hindi pwede. Kaya antayin natin yung referral ng Security Council para investigahan yung war crimes committed by Russia. Now, the court is designed to complement existing national judicial systems. Take note, it can exercise jurisdiction only when the national courts are unwilling or unable to investigate or prosecute crimes. Therefore, the responsibility is left to the individual states. That's why nung pinapag-comment ng ICC ang Philippine government regarding the prosecution of former President Duterte, ang reason ng ating the Department of Justice sa ICC, we are willing and able to prosecute. That's why ICC has no jurisdiction to prosecute Duterte. Problem is, there has been no case filed against Duterte as of this time. Okay? So kaya, paano natin sabihin na we are able and willing to prosecute, ay eh, wala pang kasong naipapile. So yun na nga ang reason. Walang ipinail na kaso dito bakit bumiretso sa ICC. Okay? So that is a technical issue on jurisdiction of the ICC. Will ICC acquire jurisdiction over Duterte when in fact the National Court has not yet received any allegation or any case filed against Duterte? When he was a sitting president, that could be justified because unless you impeach the president, you cannot file criminal cases against him in our local courts. Okay? That's why ICC took cognizance of it. Del 2017 pa yung uh, kasong ipinail habang kay Presidente Duterte. So ICC has jurisdiction for genocide or mass killing, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. Okay? The ICC is governed by the Assembly of Parties. All the 123 members are parts of the Assembly of State Parties. The court consists of four organs. Presidency, Judicial Division, the Office of the Prosecutor, and the Registry. Now, the Assembly of Parties are composed of all the member states. Okay? So, pagka nagbubotohan dyan, every state is entitled to just one vote. And majority of the decisions are carried out by the consensus of the majority. Okay? Ang headquarters nito ay nandun sa The Hague, the Netherlands. Sa, ito dati yung Peace Palace. No? Nandun din ang headquarters ng United Nations International Court of Justice. At present, the president serves for uh, a term of three years. So from 2021 up to 2024, si Firor Hopmanski of Poland. How do you pronounce that? <laughs> then you have the judicial division. There are 18 judges organized into three divisions, the pre-trial, the trial division, and the appeals division. Ito yung highest uh, body sa ICC. Judges are elected by the court to the court by the Assembly of State Parties. They serve a nine-year term of office and are not generally eligible for re-election. All judges must be national of state parties to the Rome Statute. At hindi po pwede na more than one judge belonging to the same nationality. They must be persons of high moral character. Impartiality and integrity who possess the qualifications required in the respective states for appointment to the highest judicial office, meaning Supreme Court qualification. 
Si Miriam Santiago, nung nabubuhay pa, ay na-elect dito as one of the judges in 2012. However, for whatever reason, hindi siya pinapadala ng notice kasi under the rules of the ICC, a judge after election must be called to report. So 2014 na, Miriam Santiago has not yet received any notice to report and assume her office. And then mag-i-election, Miriam Santiago, uh, tawag dito, renounce or he surrendered it. Sabi niya, ayoko na kasi tatakbo akong presidente and true enough, she ran for president. So yung bakanting posisyon kung saan si Miriam dapat ang uupo ay nagkaroon ng bagong eleksyon. So a Filipino was elected as the first and only judge, first and only Filipino judge, I should say, in the ICC noong 2015. Itong si Dean Raul Pangalangan, former Dean of the UP College of Law. However, he just completed the unfinished term of Miriam supposedly. So 2012, nine years, nag-retire siya noong May 2021. Then the Philippines withdraw, so hindi na pwede mag-elect dyan ng Filipino judge again. Unless we rejoin the ICC. Ano? Now, the office of the prosecutor is the one in charge of investigation and filing cases before the ICC. Okay? Now, the prosecutor may open investigation under three circumstances. Number one, when a situation is referred to him by a state party. Number two, when a situation is referred to him by the United Nations. So, ang tanong natin, bakit? hindi naman Pilipinas ang nag-refer doon sa kaso ni Presidente Duterte. These are private individuals. O hindi rin ito ni-refer ng United Nations Security Council. So what happened? Bakit nag-acquire ng jurisdiction at nagsimula ng preliminary inquiry ang ICC? Because of number three, the pre-trial chamber authorized the prosecutor to open an investigation. Pwede pala yun. Yes, that is guaranteed by the UA, I mean the um, statute, Rome statute. No? So nag-open ang investigation because they receive information from other sources like individuals. Individuals yung nag-file eh. Ditong si Attorney Jude Sabio, if I remember correctly. Ano? Okay, an NGO. Pwede yan. Now, any person being investigated may request the disqualification or inhibition of any of the prosecutor. At ang request na ito ay dadali niya sa appeals division, which is the highest division of the ICC. And then it has a registry that performs the non-judicial function, parang itong clerk of court. The registrar heads the registry. And he is elected by the judges to a five-year term. Now, the Rome Statute defines war crime under Article 8. Ano ba yung war crime? Grave breaches of the Geneva Convention of August 12, 1949. Kasi nagkaroon ang Geneva Convention on war crimes. No? Hmm. Ito, Any of the following acts against persons or property protected under the provisions of the relevant Geneva Convention. Ano ba yun? So, willful killing. Di ba? Torture. Inhuman treatment, including biological experiments. Kaya nga, ito si Hitler. Nagka-problema dyan. Di ba? Kasi under the Geneva Convention, you cannot conduct biological experiments, lalo na sa civilian population. Willfully causing great suffering. Serious injury to body or health. Extensive destruction and appropriation of property. Meaning, kinukuha mo yung property, ninanakaw. Di ba? Now, what is Russia doing? If we are to believe the reports, since March or since February, Ukraine, deadly attacks kill injured civilians, destroy homes. E may prinsipyo tayo sa conduct of warfare, The principle of necessity. You only utilize force that is enough to subdue the enemy. You do not include civilian population because that will also violate the principle of humanity. 
There are principles that we observe in the conduct of warfare. And Putin is obviously violating all of those. Compelling a prisoner of war eh, to join and serve the forces of the hostile state. Ukrainians were forced to serve in the Russian force. Willfully depriving a prisoner of war and other protected person of the rights to fair and regular trial. Unlawful deportation or transfer or unlawful confinement, taking of hostages. According to those who are accusing Russia of war crimes, ito, if we are to believe Reuters, ito ay isang independent at uh, uh, competent uh, news organization worldwide, Mariupol, one of the cities in Ukraine, ay sinasabi, yung mga tao daw ay forcefully deported to Russia. Okay? And also, aggression. Aggression means the planning, preparation, initiation, or execution by a person in a position of effectively to exercise control over or to direct the political or military action of a state in violation of the UN Charter. Exactly yan ang ginawa ni Putin. Hindi rin ba yan ang ginawa sa atin ng China? Nung in-invade ng China ang Scarborough Shoal, ang kaibahan lang walang civilian population ng Scarborough Shoal. Okay? Yan. So the territory or the invasion or attack by the armed forces of a state. Diba? So Russia is attacking Ukraine. Ang China hindi pa naman ginagawa yan. Pero binubuli ang ating armed forces na dumadaan sa West Philippine Sea. Then bombardment by the armed forces of a state against the territory of another state. Eh, ginagawa ng Russia. That's aggression. Blockade of the ports or coasts. Di ba inaharangan din ng China yung ating mga fishing vessel? <laughs> Pero hindi naman kasi military vessel. Ano? An attack by the armed forces of a state on the land, sea, or air forces, or marine and air fleets of another state. That's aggression. And the use of armed forces of one state which are within the territory of another state with the agreement of the receiving state in contravention of the conditions provided in the agreement, etc. So violation of peace treaty. And then the action of a state in allowing its territory which it has placed at the disposal of another state. Probably Belarusia is doing that. Kasi pinapayagan ng Belarusia na gamitin ang teritoryo niya for the Russian army to launch attacks against Ukrainian targets. So we might as well include Belarusia a subservient state to Russia in the war crimes or crimes of aggression. Okay? So in the case of President Duterte, itong si Atty. Sabio filed a case against him for the supposed continuously, repeatedly, unchangingly committed crimes against humanity. And that under him, killing drug suspects and other criminals has become best practice. Totoo kaya ito? Now, preliminary inquiry into the alleged crime committed by President Duterte, the first in Southeast Asia under the Rome Statute, has been initiated. The International Criminal Court has launched an initial inquiry. Okay? At ang kaso ni Presidente Duterte, crimes against humanity. Dahil doon sa kanyang drugs war. Dahil sa kanya raw, Operation Tokham. Alam ko, nahibalo nyo ang Tokham ba? Tok, katok, hangyo, uh, kausapin. Pero diri sa Manila, Tokbang. Sabi nila, Tokbang. Tok, Tok, Bang, Bang. <laughs> yeah, sabi ko dun sa wife ko uh, kaya lahat pala ng addict sumusurrender o pag hindi na sumurrender napapatay Amin, bakit? Eh, gusto ko rin sumurrender eh, bakit? addict ka ba? Ko, oo addict ako sa'yo <laughs> okay joke lang sabi niyo may kalukuhan kang ginagawa no? bira naman nagpapakyut ka no? may kalukuhan pa okay so the prosecutor ito yung prosecutor Pato Bensauda from Gambia has already initiated the preliminary inquiry. Among others, sabi niya, yung ginawa ni Presidente Duterte have led to 3,000, over 3,000 deaths in the past three months alone. Grabe. 
di ba? I am deeply concerned about these alleged killings and the fact that public statements of high officials of the Republic of the Philippines seem to condone killing. Kasi alam niyo, ito, hindi naman uh, ito unknown sa ating lahat, di ba? Pagka nagsalita ang presidente natin, sa kanya siguro, biro, sabi niya, patayin natin yan, ha? bigyan ko kayo ng reward pag pinatay niya yan, yung mga ganong statements, for us, naiintindihan natin siya eh. Baka nagbibiro lang, talagang seryoso lang siya, but in the international community, particularly the foreigners, the foreign media, who do not understand the personality of President Duterte, eh, to them, policy yung sinabi niya eh. Kasi he's the President of the Republic eh. Remember, pag ang Presidente nagsalita sa international community, it's a policy statement. Regardless of whether it is a joke or not, diba? kaya nga nagkakaproblema si Presidente Duterte doon sa mga rape jokes niya eh. So, ano ang sagot ni Presidente? You do not have jurisdiction of even to conduct a preliminary investigation. So, you miss Pato, referring to Pato Ben Sauda, don't come here because I will bar you. You cannot exercise any proceedings here without basis. That is illegal. I will arrest you. So, I do not know if it is fortunate or unfortunate, Pato Ben Sauda has completed her term as prosecutor. So, nanahimik ito. In 2022, after the president has left power, eh, another prosecutor was appointed and has taken the files of the case of President, uh, President Duterte. An English lawyer, or British lawyer, hindi naman yun, ano? Prosecutor Karim Khan. At ang sabi niya, Aba, itutuloy natin yung probe. Lalo na ngayon, eh, hindi na siya presidente. Okay? That's why, ang sagot ng ating DOJ, there has been no case filed against President Duterte. So how can our courts prosecute him? Eh, sabi naman ng iba, eh, kasi nakaupo sa kapangyarihan niya eh. So before you can charge him, kailangan impeach siya. There was an impeachment attempt. But it never prospered. Eh kasi kahit naman ako ang tumingin, ano? Eh talagang may problema yung impeachment complaint that was filed in 2017. So ang ginawa ni Presidente Duterte who withdrew from the ICC. Now, can he do that? Ang sagot, we signed the Rome Statute on December 8, 2000. But it took us almost 11 years ha, para tayo ay maging member. Okay, so naging member tayo November 2011. And then we withdrew on this uh, on March 17, 2018. Can we withdraw? Ang sabi niyan, March 19, 2019 nag-take effect eh. Yes, we can. Because the Rome Statute itself under Article 127 provides that a state party may by written notification addressed to the UN Secretary General, withdraw from this statute. The withdrawal will take effect one year after the date of receipt unless a later date is specified in the notification. Sabi natin, mag-withdraw kami. So within one year. Now, pwede na bang ma-absuelto ang presidente dun sa crime at wala ng jurisdiction ang ROMS, ang ICC? The answer is no. A state shall not be discharged by reason of its withdrawal from the obligations arising from the statute while it was a party to the statute. The case was filed against President Duterte eh, while we were still a member of the ICC. So its withdrawal will not affect in any manner our supposed cooperation with the ICC. Kasi may bayad tayo dyan kapag ka nag, may member, um, all members are required to share in the expenses. So may membership fee, may binabayaran tayong annual fees, so nakatipid daw ang gobyerno natin. Because we withdrew. Okay? So unlike the UN Charter, gusto rin mag-withdraw ng Presidente Duterte sa UN, but unlike the UN Charter, itong Rome Statute, mayroong exit clause, and that is Article 127. There is no such provision in the UN Charter. Okay? So another question was asked, when the press, when the Philippines joined that uh, International Criminal Court, the treaty needed concurrence 
by the two-thirds vote of the members of the Senate. Okay? Under Article 7 of our Constitution. So, if in joining a treaty or signing a treaty, its effectivity needs the concurrence of the Senate, don't we need the same concurrence when the President withdraws from a treaty? The answer could be found in the 2021 case of Pangilinan versus Cayetano. Senator Pangilinan and several other petitioners went to the Supreme Court and asked the court, are we not entitled to concur or reject the withdrawal from the Rome Statute by the President? Okay? Kasi kung papasok ka sa treaty, kailangan mo kami. Pag aalis ka sa treaty, hindi mo na kami kailangan. Parang hindi tama. But according to the Supreme Court speaking through Justice Leonen, the chairman of the best bar ever. At talaga naman, best bar ever. Ano? Mm, dami naging abogado. Sana ngayon, best bar pa rin. Eh? Mm, wala na lang yung ever. <laughs> While the Philippine Constitution under Article 7, Section 21 provides that a vote of two-thirds of all the members of the Senate is required in ratifying a treaty, there is no similar specification for the withdrawal from a treaty. Therefore, vesting the power to withdraw from a treaty to the president alone. Okay? Naintindihan natin. Hmm. So, hindi kailangan. You know what? The age-old principle of and tawag dyan, express your unions as exclusive ulterior. What the law does not include, it excludes. Di ba? So, wala namang pong constitutional provision eh, na nagsasabi na pagka nag-withdraw sa treaty, kailangan kayo. Hindi kayo kailangan. O, malis kayo sa aking harapan. <laughs> Parang ages yata yan, ha? Hmm. Ngayon, siguro, alam nyo, I could just uh, guess, probably, the framers of the 1987 constitution were not expecting that a president will be elected who would want to withdraw from a treaty. Kaya hindi nila nilagyan ng ganyan. O since wala iyan sa Constitution, we cannot assume. Di ba? Huwag maging assuming. Kasi pag assuming ka, nasasaktan ka. <laughs> okay? Hmm. Huwag mag-assume. Kala mo kayo na, pero walang kayo in all levels. Ha? Okay. Ghosting daw. Hindi naman, kala mo lang eh, mag-MU kayo, pero ikaw pala ay eh, mag-isang umiibig lang. Ha? So the President as the primary architect of foreign policy, sabi ng Korte Suprema, is subject to the Constitution. Eh, wala namang provision yung Constitution natin eh. An existing statute, as there were provisions in a prior law, and the Supreme Court was referring to Republic Act 9851, the law that implemented the Rome Statute in the local level. Ano yun? That is our uh, act on crimes against international humanitarian law, genocide, and other crimes against humanity. But look at the complainants. Have they filed a case against Duterte using 9851? The answer is no. There has been no case filed against Duterte in our courts. So kaya, yan ang sabi nitong si uh, DOJ ng Pilipinas sa ICC. You cannot acquire jurisdiction because our courts are willing to prosecute. Yet, there has been no crime filed or charges filed against the former president. And that Republic Act 1951 defines war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity and penalized them under Section 7. So, kung wala kayong ipinail dito sa local court, why file it in an international court? Now, ang justification ng mga complainants, kasi at the time it was filed, Duterte was the sitting president and under our constitution and our laws and jurisprudence, the sitting president needed to be impeached before criminal charges could be filed against him in our courts. So, yun ang justification. Eh ngayon, nawala na sa kapangyarihan ng presidente. Meron pa bang immunity ang incumbent pre, ang, ang former president? Ang sabi ng Korte Suprema, wala na. The immunity lasts while you are in power. 
after your term ends, your immunity ends. Okay? Kaya yung iba, gusto palagi nasa power para may immunity. Okay? Maganda siguro yan. Pagka kayong mga lawyers na at gusto magnegosyo, tayo kayo ng milti, ang pangalan sovereignty o kaya immunity. <laughs>